In a video I released a couple of months ago, I detailed NASA's new plan for the manned exploration of the solar system. It's a very aggressive plan that involves a number of targets, starting of course with the moon. And of course, as we all know, the plan this time is to go to stay, not to plant a flag, not to explore a few places, take a few samples and leave, not to explore places like the Oriental Basin that you're looking at right now and then go back to Earth for another half century. No, this time we're going and leaving a permanent presence on our satellite in a place called Shackleton Crater, where we believe there are trillions of tons of water ice which will support a permanent manned presence for quite some time but obviously this is not the end of NASA's ambitions after the moon the next target is not Mars but Venus a Venus flyby mission is how it's described and this decision was made before the recent discoveries about life, indicating that NASA suspected the presence of life for quite some time. And this is an aggressive mission, of course, that involves airships and a variety of other types of new technologies, but still will be a lot easier than a Mars mission simply because of the proximity of our sister planet, and also because it's easier to abort a mission to Venus than it is to abort a mission to Mars, making it a more appropriate dress rehearsal for the Red Planet. But if there is life to be discovered in the Venusian atmosphere, I suspect it's going to be Rocket Lab that beats NASA to the punch. Just as Dr. Levin, in my interview that I recently had with him, linked in the description, that suggested that the Chinese are going to beat NASA to the punch in discovering life on Mars. Oh well guys, you shouldn't have spent so many decades fiddling about in low Earth orbit. And then, of course, it's off to Mars, although if Elon Musk gets his way, he will have been there along with SpaceX for quite some time by the time NASA gets around to it, unless the two execute a mission together, which is what I hope happens. But as all of you know, this is a planet of endless wonders, and in my opinion, the most appropriate planet for man to colonize. No matter what, this is the best planet for a second home for the human species. And look at that volcano again and how gigantic it is in comparison to just about every country in Europe. Olympus Mons alone could consume my entire life when it comes to exploring places. Mars is definitely the highlight of NASA's plans. But the last target on the list may surprise you, and that's Ceres, the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, but a tiny place by just about anybody else's standards. It's tiny by compared to the moon or compared to Pluto. Why this place? Why not the moons of Jupiter or Saturn? Well, believe it or not, this little asteroid could be a game changer not only for exploring the solar system, but for the whole human race. And we're going to find out why in just a moment. Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So, Ceres, a place that few people who aren't into astronomy or astrophysics or space travel has ever heard of. Few school kids have heard of it when they do their basic study of the solar system. It's just really not something that many people talk about. So why is it on NASA's hit list, especially when it comes to manned exploration? Why do they want to go here of all places? 
I mean, it is a very large asteroid in the asteroid belt, um, the largest, as a matter of fact, and there are a lot of unique aspects to it. It has an awful lot of carbon, an awful lot of water, but so do a lot of other asteroids. So why is this one in particular so interesting to where NASA feels that a manned expedition needs to go there? Well, the reason amongst many things is that Ceres is what I like to call the gateway to the belt, a means by which mankind can explore not only the entire asteroid belt, but also the outer solar system as well. An endless supply of fuel, of water, and also a place for man to establish a permanent presence. Maybe not a huge presence, and it's certainly not going to be easy establishing and maintaining a presence in this place. But at the same time, it has the potential to make those who decide to strike out into the solar system not only very wealthy, but also to give them an opportunity to sustain human civilization and possibly even to discover new life. Yes, new life on an asteroid. And I'm gonna tell you more about that right now. Many people don't realize that we have already visited Ceres. The Dawn spacecraft, after getting a gravity assist from Mars, first paid a visit to the asteroid of Vesta. Like many asteroids, both Vesta and Ceres have highly elliptical orbits, and they don't orbit according to the ecliptic like planets do. Instead, they're highly inclined, Vesta about 7 degrees and Ceres about 10 degrees. So Ceres has an orbit that's quite unlike a planet, getting as far away as 445,000 kilometers from the Sun, and as close as 382,000. Now, in spite of the fact that Ceres looks like a moon or a planet, it's much, much smaller. Its diameter is only 939 kilometers or so, and its gravity is less than 3% that of Earth. However, in spite of its small size, like most C-class asteroids, it has lots of water. As a matter of fact, possibly more water than Earth. Ceres also has far fewer craters than one would expect for an asteroid of its age, and this suggests the presence of cryovolcanoes and a subsurface ocean, although this subject is hotly debated. Regardless, this composition means that Ceres is an endless supply of fuel, of oxygen, and of water, making it a perfect location for a base to explore the asteroid belt. So let's look at this world in greater detail. Probably the most exciting thing about it is the Okotter Crater, which during Dawn's last pass around the asteroid detected bright ejecta material, as if from recent cryovulcanism that's going on at this moment from a subsurface ocean, and also the presence of salts, leading of course to an environment that is very conducive to life. Again, this topic is hotly debated, but the mere possibility is exciting and reason enough for us to go as far as I'm concerned and as far as NASA is concerned. We move on to Ikapati, which is a small crater about 50 kilometers in diameter, featuring a mountainous area plus pits and cracks and unusually small again for an asteroid that should have been hit by much larger objects. But perhaps my favorite feature on this asteroid is Ahuna Mons, and I may be butchering these names, but it's the most obvious example of an ice cano in the solar system, standing 4,000 meters tall, absolutely gigantic for an asteroid of this size, formed of ice, mud, and the streaks that run down it are salt deposits. 
Now, in spite of the indications that this cryovulcanism may have resurfaced much of this asteroid, there are some very large craters that have not been resurfaced, such as this one here, the Urvara crater, once again, maybe butchering it, but it's been here for over 140 million years and is quite a large crater with quite a prominent mountain in the middle of it. But then we have the Haolani crater, very small, with bright ejecta once again indicating a subsurface ocean and a strange temperature anomaly, much colder inside than out. And finally, we end our tour with two craters. We have Yalode, which is a very large crater on this asteroid, also quite ancient, but still not nearly as many old craters as there should be on an asteroid billions of years old. And then we have Dantu finishing off the tour. A very mysterious world, far, far different than just a rock in space with a bunch of craters as we thought it might be. An unusual place for us to explore. But here's an important factor that makes Ceres important as a base. Like most asteroids, it orbits at a different speed than the other asteroids in the belt. And so the Dawn spacecraft took advantage of this, paralleling Vesta until it caught up with Ceres and made its closest approach, and then simply transferred over. Anybody who wanted to exploit the asteroid belt or mine it could do the same thing with Ceres every time it passed close to a valuable asteroid. Arguably the most valuable of these asteroids is an object called 16 Psyche, which is the remnants of a failed planet, or rather its core, and it's comprised of all kinds of valuable metals. Of course, iron, but on top of that, gold, platinum, and a variety of rare metals that we are running very short of here on Earth. The Chinese, who are responsible for 90% of the rare metal production on the planet, claim that supplies of metals such as deprosium, neodymium, and I may be mispronouncing these things, and lanthamum, which are coveted for their conductive and magnetic properties and used in everything from laptops to missile guidance systems, could be exhausted within 20 years. However, 16 Psyche probably has ample supplies of all of these given its similarity to our own core. The salvation of the human race could very well lie in the asteroid belt. And this may explain why NASA has accelerated their plan to launch a probe to 16 Psyche by 2026, at least its arrival time. And by interesting coincidence, Elon Musk and the Falcon Heavy will be providing the launch vehicle to send this probe to this incredibly valuable asteroid. And by the way, that's 700 quintillion dollars. But the best way to exploit asteroids like this are not to send massive fleets out to bring back huge amounts of rare metals that would simply devalue the metals. Like OPEC, anybody who gets into asteroid mining would release these valuable metals under a controlled situation. Using Ceres as your primary base camp, an asteroid mining company would send out mining ships to various asteroids as they came close, and use a variety of different automated digging machines to exploit the asteroids, like this one which chops up the surface regolith and then carries the ore back to, pro to a processor or other alternatives like this machine which simply tethers itself to the surface and digs down into the asteroid's surface, bringing up ore and then sifting it, determining which is the most valuable and then processing the ore as it draws it up. There's a variety of different sorts of machines that are already on the books, have been designed and ready to go, just nobody's invested in it. And this has been remarkably short-sighted because anybody who did invest in the initial infrastructure to do this sort of thing, which granted would be quite expensive, would become fabulously wealthy in the long run. 
The rare metals on 16 Psyche alone, if released to the earth market bit by bit under a controlled circumstance rather than flooding the market, could result in trillions of dollars of revenue. And by the way, this is the honeybee from the Transastra Corporation, designed to either capture tiny asteroids or to retrieve processed ore from a larger asteroid like 16 Psyche and take it back to a mining ship or to some other location. And guess what? It runs on solar power and also water. In addition, asteroid mining would not need to be restricted to just huge asteroids. The Queen Bee, which is designed, by the way, for the SpaceX Starship, as you can see right here, is designed to capture smaller asteroids and to bring the whole thing back for processing. And as you can see, it is enormous once it is deployed, considering how small of a space it can be fitted into in the first place. The Queen Bee uses evaporated water ice for propulsion, so Ceres has all the fuel and all the propellant that this vessel needs in order to capture asteroids. Ceres could deploy hundreds of these things to capture asteroids and bring them back for processing or to return to a different destination like Mars or Earth. You don't need a lot of Delta V to escape the asteroid belt and return to the planet that wants these asteroids. That's the magic of working in the belt. And speaking of Delta V, Earth would not be the best starting point to set up a base on Ceres in the first place because of its gravity. This is probably my favorite Delta V map, although you probably want to pause it and uh, put it on the biggest screen you possibly can. But instead of squinting, I can tell you that it actually takes less Delta V to go all the way from Mars to Ceres than it takes to go from Earth to the Moon. That's right, it's easier to go to the asteroid belt from Mars than it is for us to go to the moon. And this has nothing to do with distance, it's all about gravity. Since Mars' gravity is one-third that of Earth, it is far easier to get ships out to the asteroid belt from this planet than it is from Earth. Therefore, the future Martians, the colonists of this world, are going to be able to exploit the riches of the asteroid belt far more efficiently than Earthlings are going to be able to exploit even asteroids in their own vicinity. Quite a difference, potentially making Martians the richest people in the solar system in the future. And by the way, I did another video about this very subject and Elon Musk becoming the world's first trillionaire just a little while ago, and I have it linked at the end of the video in case you're interested. But Ceres has other uses besides asteroid mining. It has also been suggested that Ceres could act as a way station for vessels on their way out to the outer solar system, to the moons of Jupiter, for example, because Ganymede and Callisto are actually outside of Jupiter's radioactive influence. However, Ceres is not necessarily the perfect asteroid for this because of its unusual orbit. There are better ones, such as 24 Themis, which is closer to to our orbital level in the ecliptic and Mars as well. But still, Ceres could serve as the base camp for setting up other bases, such as 24 Themis, in order to get to faraway destinations like this. It could also serve as an emergency stop-off point. So, in summary, Ceres could facilitate our visiting sites like this. It could also act as a refueling station, not only for the Starship, because you can make methalox fuel out of carbon and water, but also for nuclear thermal ships, as all you need is hydrogen propellant for that kind of propulsion. And it has plenty of hydrogen as well, bound into its water. 
And of course, there's its use as asteroid mining headquarters and the possibility of finding life. But what about the extremely low gravity and the long-term effects that would have on human beings and the inability to grow food there? Well, let's return to our flyover and we'll talk really briefly about that. First of all, as far as greenhouses are concerned, we must not underestimate how much sunlight actually reaches Ceres. Yes, it's much further away from the sun, but it has an extremely thin atmosphere and filters out almost no sunlight. Therefore, a lot more sunlight actually reaches the surface, so it would not actually hinder any sort of surface growing at all. Also, orbiting mirrors could be used to concentrate the intensity of sunlight, and plus there are plenty of plants that grow in low-light conditions anyway. And as far as the gravity is concerned, remember that we're going to be living subsurface anyway, and it has been proposed that we have subsurface rotating habitats that provide their own artificial gravity, and Martian explorers wouldn't need habitats nearly as large because they would be used to one-third gravity. Now, all of this would require a huge amount of engineering, of course, but maybe Elon Musk's boring company could provide us with the necessary equipment to create something like that. Oh yes, and one more detail. Because of its low gravity and escape velocity, inhabitants of Ceres could use another piece of engineering to travel about the asteroid belt. This is one of the few places in the solar system where you could use an electromagnetic mass driver to propel people instead of cargo without killing them with the required g-forces. That's right, you could propel a ship carrying a crew through the asteroid belt without any initial propellant. Of course, you'd need propellant to slow down and maneuver, but still. So in the end, this humble little asteroid is just as alien and just as exciting a destination as Mars or Venus or any place else. It has so many uses and so many mysteries. It's an ideal next destination for the human species. I have to admit, I'm rather sad that I'm probably never going to see it. So at the end of it all, this all sounds pretty good, doesn't it? access to an endless list of supplies and raw materials for the human civilization as we expand out into the solar system. Ceres being the main base camp for human beings to operate from, asteroid miners, explorers out into the outer solar system, really so many different uses that this asteroid can be put to. This dwarf planet, as many people like to call it, and certainly it does hold a lot of the same characteristics of a planet, including, most excitedly to me, I think, the prospect of life. That especially is very exciting. But at the same time, it also fills me with a sense of concern. The folks who colonize Mars, they are going to be motivated by high ideals, the ideals of exploration and sustaining the human species, those are extremely noble goals. But those who go to Ceres, those who exploit the asteroid belt, they are going to be exposed to extremely harsh conditions. And I fear that their main motivation, aside from perhaps the initial explorers, but the rest of them, those who mine the asteroid belt for its resources and become insanely wealthy in the process, well, they're going to be motivated by the almighty dollar. And not only that, I'm also concerned that there's going to be a lot of players in the game once one player becomes fabulously rich. There's going to be many, many more that are going to want to become equally rich. Are they going to play nice? Human history would indicate otherwise. And so our idealistic notion of colonizing the solar system for the goal of 
the salvation of the human species, our lifeboat for the human race to make sure that we survive in the long term, is that going to be put at risk if we start fighting over the resources of the asteroid belt? Well, there's endless sources of science fiction that would say that we are going to end up fighting over it. I certainly hope not. I certainly hope that by the time we get to that point, if we have not destroyed ourselves, especially on our home planet, that we are going to be motivated by something different, that the people who do have the courage and the the drive to explore the solar system are just simply going to be a different type of human being. And speaking of a different type of human being, as I have mentioned many times before, since it's so much easier to exploit the asteroid belt from Mars, I have a feeling that these people, these Martians that exploit the asteroid belt are not going to insist on taking Earth gravity with them because they're not going to be used to Earth gravity themselves. And it's going to make it a hell of a lot easier, as we've seen in the video, to exploit the belt if they operate in the environment that they're used to in one third gravity. And as I've said a number of times before, I see a number of different strains of humanity surviving as we expand and those strains being created by different gravitational needs. Now, of course, everybody has the idea with O'Neill cylinders and such that we'll always be able to take our gravity with us but I'm not certain if Martians will, if they're going to want to stay in full Earth gravity isolated from the planet that they're so excited about until they get to venture out into it from time to time. I really don't know if that's how things are going to end up turning out, because as I've said before, aside from Venus and Earth, there's no place else in the solar system that requires that we have a full G of tolerance that Martians could operate very comfortably in most places in the solar system and don't need to be accustomed to Earth gravity. It's hard to say. I'm very excited to see what happens in the near future, but sadly, I don't think I'm going to live to see the end of it. But all of that having been said, and I think that's probably my favorite expression, I must always mention the coffee cup. You know the deal, 40,000 subscribers, and we are growing like crazy, this channel. And I am very appreciative of that. And once again, many ways to support me and the unusual content that appears here through Patreon, through my supporters who make these spaceships, Spaceship Mania, so many different ways. So please, if you are able to support me in one way or another, or just subscribe and like the video, that alone would be a huge help. So once again, until we're ready to take that next step beyond Mars, make the decision as to whether or not we are really going to commit to explore this magnificent solar system and all the wonders that it holds for us. I urge all of you, to stay angry about space.